Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> this is take two. We are tired and we forgot to actually uh, switch on the microphone in the previous take. Oopsie. Yeah, very professional. So we're outside, oh no, we're inside the Cinestar uh, Film Theater in Potsdamer Platz. We were at a talk by Dolby about the new system Dolby Atmos. It was, I actually, I, at first I didn't want to go and I was a bit indecisive and then I ran after Javier and I was very glad I did because I found it very interesting. So Dolby Atmos is the next step after Dolby 5.1, 7.1 and it's now not Dolby 13.1 or something, it's Dolby Atmos, which they said is something like Dolby 64.1 and how does it work? Um, yeah, well, I, I just wanted to say, uh, back in 2002, when I graduated from film studies back in Venezuela, I wrote my thesis about um, the transition of the Dolby Stereo to Dolby Digital system. So this is pretty important for me, because this is actually the transition to Dolby Digital to Dolby, from Dolby Digital to Dolby Atmos, which is a major leap, because what they are doing is uh, they are transforming the system into not clusters of speakers like 5.1 and 7.1 where, where you had like different clusters of speakers and you would pan around those clusters but with Dolby Atmos you have control of every single speaker and uh, so that creates a completely 3D environment and each speaker is manipulated the way the sound designer or the director wants. <laughs> In addition, you have speakers overhead, so it's not just around you, now it's really also um, above you. And uh, they showed a couple of clips where they demonstrated like what it can do, and I found it like, I got actually goosebumps once in a while. Like there was a rain clip uh, where you were sitting in the middle and you could hear the rain all around you. And the sound makes you believe that it's really raining. So this is, is fantastic. Yeah, so... One thing that's very important, is, and one of the focus points of, of that's, that thesis that I wrote, is that sound, sound design, and through Dolby Digital, is a tool, it's a narrative tool that directors and sound designers can use uh, to tell a story and create emotions, because sound is much, much more effective in, in creating emotions in the audience, even than picture. So, uh, no matter if you have a big war action film, or a very small intimate film, sound design, surround design, Atmos, and, and, and all these tools are a major, major important uh, way to uh, convey your story. So no matter how small your movie is, please uh, think about sound design. I always believe that sound is um, actually more important than the picture because nobody wants to watch like a film, how brilliant it may look with bad sound. But it does actually work like if the picture is mediocre, but the sound is really great. And Dolby made a uh, research and they showed um, people a clip. First just a picture and then they asked them like how big the emotional involvement was, then just the sound and then sound and the picture. The interesting part is just the picture is not really getting very far, so the emotional involvement is very low. If the audience, the test audience, were just listening to the sound, the emotional engagement was almost as high as if they were watching the um, picture with the audio. So that is also how important audio is. That's it. So next up, we're going to try to see a talk about uh, film uh, publicity and film critique, which is major, of major importance also for filmmakers to know once the film is finished, 
how do I launch it? How do I launch a film? So uh, it's a great panel to, to get to, to know these people and to see what they have to see that normally you don't, you don't have access to because we're only thinking about cameras and scripts and things. But what about later? How do I launch this film? So film publicity and how to your critics also uh, as a way of, of launching your film. Basically, we, we want to discuss how, when you tell us and make a film, how it, you get it promoted, how you get it launched, because in the pre-production, the production, and the money is assembled, and shooting and editing is one thing, but there's no point in doing all that unless it can be actually launched from the marketplace. We are at Sao de Hao 2. We just saw a panel about publicity and criticism, film critics, but actually it was mainly about publicity. Yeah, as, uh, two publicists were talking, so and they were talking about their job, what they do, uh, how they approach with their films, the public, and, and stuff like this. Yeah, I mean, I find it really, really enlightening, actually, because this is somehow, this is something that you don't get in touch, like, very frequently, especially if you're an independent filmmaker where you don't really have the budget to think about publicity, hiring a publicist, having PR for your film. So it was really enlightening in, in many ways. For example, they talked about how they work now, um, they actually set some numbers, like for a small film, it could cost you like 2,000 to 15,000 euros to create a PR campaign uh, for a festival or for launching a movie, and how you prepare a press book that nowadays everyone prefers a PDF uh, document instead of like print material, unless you have like really good graphics, um, that kind of things. What else? Yeah, I, I think like specifically for very small indie productions with a small budget is even more so important. I, I say this after having done two uh, very low budget films and I just realized what we could have done better in Kings and how actually we made a lot of wrong decisions I think as well like in uh, distributing. I mean, well, we learned a lot so this is like, uh, from that perspective it hasn't really been wrong but um, how you treat your marketing and distribution plan can make so much a difference. So it's not really just make a good movie and it will find its audience. It's not the case. Yeah, and it's uh, really important for someone like that to also see the movie uh, because they assess what kind of festivals are your movie best uh, fitted to and they will work towards uh, getting into those festivals, getting press uh, look at your film and of course trying to convince the press to like your film. Uh, so that was really cool. Actually, I, I had the chance to leave one of, one of the screeners with one of them because that's one of the, the things I'm trying to figure out right now. Like, what is, um, what, what can we do with this film? How, how high can we aim or not at all? And so in that terms, I think it's very valuable information. Yeah, and uh, now all what's left is watching two more films today. Friedrich Stadtpalast, Francis Ha, and uh, Le Miserable. Right. I don't have tickets for Le Miserables. So I got one. I got one. I got one. I'm going to try to sneak in, but I'm definitely <laughs> going to see Francis Ha from, by Noah Baumbach. So I'm looking forward to that. Please welcome the director. Join me on stage, Noah Baumbach. finished watching Noah Baumbach's Francis Ha. I liked it, however it felt awfully too close to my own life, just with a difference I'm eight years older and somehow stuck around plot point two, and I haven't really decided if I'm before or after, so um, I guess you have to watch the film to uh, know what I'm talking about. 
I massively loved it. Simply. I loved it. I think it's exactly the kind of films I actually want to be doing. You it, know what? I was thinking that in between, <laughs> that this is exactly your thing. <laughs> It is, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a really beautiful film, in my opinion, and uh, uh, it's a wink to this kind of French New Wave film, you know, uh, actually, I think exactly, it's a w black and white film, and it, the reason I think it's a black and white film is because it, it was paying homage to the, to, to the Godard, especially, and actually we can hear a little bit of Truffaut in the background some, at some point, and it has this feeling... And Noah Baumbau is now like this kind of films. Uh, it's part of like this kind of new wave of American independent filmmakers that uh, I think, for example, Edward Burns and the the earlier Kevin Smith and uh, you know even even filmmakers like uh, the the Polish brothers and this kind of things. It's very it's it's a simple film, but it's uh, touching. It's funny. It's like very warm. And Greta Greta Gerwig. Yeah. It's Awesome. It's also awesome. due to like the really great work of the main actress, uh, whose performance is really great. It's it's a um, portrait of this struggling artist in New York trying to make a living and what she does. And yeah, well, yeah. you might have guessed it after I said like, well, it reminds me a little bit too much like on. Yeah. My own. I, I don't want to say your life because no. that is like a. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it relates, of course. It it uh, for us, especially as artists, it it. it It, it's a string that is uh, touched right there. It, it's very close to our own life. Uh, maybe that's why I love this so much as yeah. well. Um, But it like is it, uh, shedding light on each of the different parts of her life: artistically, her job, her um, private life, friends, and this is another thing actually like why I also liked it so much because like the relationship between the main character Frances and her friend like best friend Sophie is also very similar to a long long um, friendship I have with um, a best friend of mine and yeah it's very realistic it's just very touchingly real I don't know how to say it differently yeah and I think it is very in a way autobiographical because I think Greta I mean, Greta Gerwig actually co-wrote the film uh, um, I don't know how close to her life it is but it feels close and I, I've been I've been watching Greta Gerwig like growing in her own career I've been watching her from Joe Swanberg movies she was in the early Joe Swanberg movies with LOL and Anna, Hannah Takes the Stairs etc and then in big movies with, like Woody Allen's uh, To Love with Rome and uh, I mean I think She's awesome. So. so with that? Oh, one thing, and she was here, and I just felt so moved because she's so humble. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by all of you, and um, it's, uh, so, it's such a special privilege to be here with you, and it's um, I can't believe that you guys just all watched it. No. <laughs> so, um, thank you. I will stay on. Yeah, she's gonna watch now, like, big Hollywood. And we can't do it together, which is a shame. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't get any ticket. Um, so, but she's gonna tell us uh, later what the experience was with yes. Les Miserables, big uh, yeah. musical. And, uh, yeah, good luck with that. We will uh, then go tomorrow into day... Nine. Of it's the Berlin oh, Island. It's, this is almost over, so we'll see. It is day 10 and 11, and <laughs> that's then it. All right. All right, this is Juliana. I just saw Le Miserable, and it has, of course, like a fantastic um, cast Hugh Jackman and um, Anne Hathaway and uh, Russell Crowe, and I really liked it. I mean, it's 90% really singing, like the musical part is really strong, but the execution is brilliant, and um, the settings, the costumes, everything is brilliant. And I think personally that the singing actually supported the emotional um, intensity of the film very much. I, I admit, I cried. Um, yeah, and. Um, Lucky also I could focus fully on the film because I got an aisle seat. That means like my knees didn't hurt so much because it was playing again in the Friedrichstadtpalast and the seats there are quite tight. So I'm very happy that I saw it. I took the time, even though tomorrow I will be even more tired <laughs> than I was this morning. And um, I look forward to day nine.